very good evening to all of you ladies and gentlemen. Sorry for the slight delay due to some technical problems which needed to be sorted out. Uh, welcome to all those who are present here in this conference hall and all those who have joined us online. Uh, also from the University of Liverpool on behalf of Victoria Memorial Hall and the University of Liverpool. We are presenting this program this evening and I have a request right at the outset those who have joined us online if you could kindly mute yourselves unless those who are speaking at a particular time. That would be very helpful. Uh, it is a program to launch the virtual exhibition titled Modernity, Nationhood and the Unconscious of Nindranath Tagore and the Garden House in Konnagar. So without any further ado, may I request Mr. Samarendra Kumar, Secretary and Curator of Victoria Memorial Hall, to welcome all of us here present. So, once again, uh, good evening and namaskar. Uh, and uh, uh, those who are present here, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, invited guests, and guests uh, who are joined online. It's a really proud pleasure for me to be present on this occasion and uh, keep, uh, just introduce this exhibition, which is being done in collaboration with the uh, University of Liverpool. Uh, we have with us distinguished guest, uh, Professor Soman Bandapada from University of Liverpool. He is physically present here. Professor Peter Bruce, Dean School of Arts, University of uh, Liverpool, who has joined online. Professor Partha Mitter, Emeritus University of Sussex, who is joined uh, online. Uh, Dr. Giamel Kothron, Assistant Railback, James Belly, who are joined online. Uh, our former secretary and curator, Professor Jensen, uh, Dr. Jensen Gupta, who, has done, who started this project, uh, I think, a uh, year back. And uh, uh, I also, in, uh, uh, it's my privilege to uh, welcome uh, Professor uh, Chita Panda, who was also former secretary and curator, Victoria Memorial Hall. Uh, this collaboration uh, is uh, for online exhibition between uh, online exhibition and the launch of this co-hosted digital exhibition called Monarchy, Nationhood uh, and the Unconscious, Abhinandan Tagore and the Garden House in Kornagar. This has been organized jointly with the, uh, by the Victoria Merrill Hall, the University of Liverpool, and project seeks to create an alternative museum space, deploying latest technologies in order to carefully replicate Abhinandan Tagore Garden House in a digital format, uh, considering that the uh, reach can uh, um, uh, go to million of people, billion of people are all across the world. Uh, it contains display of virtual reproductions of the eminent artist uh, masterpieces, which has also been loaned from uh, uh, Victoria Memorial Collection. Uh, Professor uh, Soman Bandapade, who is the chief curator of this project, will shortly tell us more about this project, how it has uh, gone about that and then how this project was conceived and how we, it has come across up to this level. Uh, we, we have been trying for last uh, few months how to open this virtual exhibition and I'm very happy that today we are uh, going to launch this uh, digital exhibition. We at the Victoria Memorial have been eager collaborators with uh, various projects, uh, not only with the University of Liverpool but several other universities and across the uh, globe. And uh, in fact, I'm very uh, happy and very uh, thankful to all the people who were involved in this uh, 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 curating this exhibition and also uh, making it online display with the, all the technical and other displays there. So thank you very much. Uh, without much delay, I would request uh, Professor Bandhavad to say a few words on that and continue this program. Thank you. Thank you very much. We are indeed very, very happy that uh, Professor Shomen Mandapadhyay could come all the way to Calcutta uh, and be present here physically to introduce this project to you firsthand. And of course, he's being joined by his colleagues online whom he will introduce in due course and he will go with the flow of the event also for this evening. But the ultimate aim is that after this evening's program, uh, this will be launched officially and put online and it will be linked to the website of the Victoria Memorial Hall so that there will be a kind of landing page and once you're on the landing page it will automatically redirect you to that virtual exhibition so anybody even visiting the website of the Victoria Memorial Hall will be able to take a tour of that virtual exhibition. So that is the ultimate idea and that is the spirit of the collaboration that we wanted to express here. So Professor Bandhapadhyay, uh, the microphone is all yours, the screen is all yours, the sharing is all yours. Uh, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, I'm just wondering, I think um, I th it should be 
I'm visible here as well on screen, I think. Um, uh, probably the screen is it's frozen, I think, for some reason. Um, uh, thank you very much. Good afternoon uh, to everyone. And, uh, as, uh, and thank you, Mr. Kumar, and thank you, Mr. Roman, for organizing this uh, fantastic opportunity to open the uh, exhibition, the virtual exhibition. Um, we, uh, as uh, Mr. Roman was saying that you know, this started, and uh, Mr. Kumar said it started earlier when Dr. Shen Gupta was here, and he generously uh, agreed to support the project. And the whole idea is that we could um, really uh, convey, put across uh, 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 cultural heritage, uh, architectural heritage, artistic heritage to a wider group of uh, people. And so to raise awareness, but also to uh, push research in different and new ways. So I think that is, that is really why uh, things are uh, so important in this particular way. Um, without uh, taking many, uh, because I'll have the occasion to come back later and talk, I will uh, invite uh, Professor Peter Buys, who is the Dean of the School of Arts, uh, where we are as a School of Architecture, and uh, the School of Arts and the uh, Faculty of the Humanities and Social Sciences have been incredibly supportive of this entire project, uh, with funding coming originally from uh, that end. And so Peter Buys is uh, our Dean, uh, who is also has specialist interest in uh, the, the communication studies, cultural history and theory, uh, photography, uh, uh, English literature, drama, and so on. Uh, so without further delays, Peter, would you say a few words to welcome the group? Sure, thank you, Shoman, for the introduction. Um, and I just want to say welcome to everyone in person and online on behalf of the University of, of Liverpool and especially the School of the Arts, um, which as Shoman said, I'm the, I'm the Dean. Um, the School of Architecture is an essential part of the School of the Arts. I would really love to be there um, with you and to see the, the house uh, and the exhibition in, in person, but it's really fantastic that we've been able to make the event accessible to the many people who are unable to travel to Conagar or indeed to the Victoria Memorial Hall uh, this evening. In, in a nice bit of historical symmetry, I'm speaking to you from Abercrombie Square in Liverpool, which is home to the Liverpool School of Architecture and was, I think, uh, some Somebody will correct me if I'm wrong, built in the same decade as the Conagar Garden House we are celebrating today. Yes, and, and Showman, what I wasn't sure about, I think the the house dates from the 1820s and Abercrombie Square around, you know, obviously the same time. So that was the connection I was trying to make. No, 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 absolutely. You're right. I think uh, the house is probably slightly later. It's probably 1830s, uh, early 1830s, but not, uh, not 1820s. But uh, yes, uh, please. Right. So <laughs> Exactly the same time, so yeah, I'm relieved yeah. that I wasn't wrong about that. I'll 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 start I'll start from there then. Um, so uh, bef before you hear in more detail from others about this project, I will say just a few words to explain how the exhibition fits into the broader heritage work we're doing here at the University of Liverpool. Heritage is one of our key research themes, and in the university is led, of course, by Professor Bandio Pathai, who also leads this exhibition project. From this ac academic year, Professor Bandi Pathai will also be leading the newly founded Heritage Research Institute at the university. This is a university-wide institute, but just to give you a sense of the scale of the work, there are over 30 staff in the School of the Arts alone who take part in heritage-related activities. Their expertise stretches across different disciplines and a number of continents and reaches beyond the usual areas of tangible and intangible heritage, taking in health, well-being, and gender issues, infrastructure and material futures, and methods and mechanisms for developing digital repositories and interpretive approaches. We're particularly proud of our leadership in using augmented reality or AR to create and test immersive experiences that allow new modes of interacting with heritage sites and artifacts. We do this in collaboration with local Liverpool institutions such as National Museums Liverpool, Tate Liverpool, and the Liverpool City and Region Authorities, as well as international ones, such as the Getty Conservation Institute, Aga Khan Trust for Culture, MIT, and ICOMOS. Among the projects that fall under the work of the theme in the new institute, I'll mention just three or four. First, back in May of this year, our School of Architecture co-hosted with RIBA North, the prestigious Aga Khan Award for Architecture, 
This included a two-day symposium with important architects, curators, and academics from around the world. Second, we've been hosting since 2020 the Virtual Visiting Fellowship Program, which is now in its third cohort. This program provides opportunities for researchers in ODA countries to gain collaborative research experience, mentoring, and career development in an international research environment. Third, I would point to the immersive visitor experience pioneered and designed by our Center for Architecture and Visual Arts, known as CAVA, at the splendid St. George's Hall in Liverpool. CAVA is, of course, taking part in today's event as well. Finally, I'd like to mention the master's program in sustainable heritage management that is run from the School of Architecture here in Abercrombie Square, and which examines heritage from the perspective of conservation, tourism, and sustainability. And there are many other things that I, I could, have, could have mentioned as well. When we identify something as heritage, we're also very conscious that we are endowing it with value. As a consequence, we sometimes avoid the more difficult aspects of heritage. Liverpool's history is inextricably linked to its role in the transatlantic slave trade. And for this reason, the University Center for the Study of International Slavery. The University Center for the Study of International Slavery focuses on difficult heritage regarding human enslavement. So to finish, I'd just like to call attention to the intriguing title of this exhibition, Modernity, Nationhood, and the Unconscious. Speakers after me will, I'm sure, say more about this title. What it reminded me of was the great essay by Ernest Renan, What is a Nation?, in which he says that a nation is defined as much by what it forgets as what it remembers. This is a crucial point to keep in mind whenever we are deciding what counts as heritage and what does not. I hope you enjoy this excellent event and this wonderful exhibition. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Thank you very much. Uh, that's, that's really, really very good to, to sort of make a start. And uh, uh, could I, with a, I know that we are sort of slightly delayed, so could I uh, invite Professor Partha Mitter, Emeritus, University of Sussex, um, to deliver the keynote. Um, Professor Mitter is uh, I don't think that we need to um, sort of uh, explain his background. He is well known for his work on Indian art, um, uh, contemporary, but also um, 19th century art, but also the reception of Indian art in the West. So with a further ado, could I invite Professor Mitter to deliver his keynote, please? It's a pleasure and an honor to be here, uh, you know, and... Um, because we're now in the presence of an amazing, innovative project. Infoprint technology, which is a new thing now in the world, enables us to create entire virtual universes. And it's, of course, entirely new in India. It's a very novel project, a virtual exhibition. Now, this pilot project was initiated and created by Professor Bandapadha and his group, team at Liverpool University. We just heard the dean. And they chose for the first hybrid digital exhibition this very interesting restoration of the actually well known, Baganbari or um, garden house in Konnavu belonging to the Tagores. So just to quickly tell you, this sort of immersive digital museum experiences are, of course, as yet non-existent in India. And um, this would be such an interesting and revolutionary event. In a country with small museum resources, this kind of project, which aims to cre create heritage structures across India, wouldn't need a great deal of expenditure because resources are scarce in India. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about the 
Gunnar Barenberg as well as Abundath, Kakodunath and Rabindath. Now, just to quickly tell you, um, garden houses, Bagalbari, on the river mostly, but also in the interior, it, it started actually for Indians in 1793. But of course, it goes back to the days of the East India Company and uh, big garden houses, I believe, in Barak and other places. So coming to the Baganbari in Kornagur, this house I believe was built in the 1830s. And as you'll see from the virtual expression, symmetrical colonial house type with central hall, verandas and flanked by bedrooms is a typical plan. Now, let me now go back to our main title, Nationalism, Modernism, uh, Nationalism, but Modernism, I believe, and the Unconscious. Now, Abhinath Tagore was a leader of the very first nationalist art movement in India, which spread, of course, all over India. And his period of development was long, but in his childhood, Abhinath speaks about uh, the Kodnagur Baganbari in Jorashagadhari. And he spent usually a bit of the summer, summer break, and um, especially talks about life in the house. So that, that's the, one of the main things here. Now, just to tell you uh, quickly, so the exhibition gallery, house garden or garden house, uh, you'll see the various images. Other galleries were developed to showcase important concerns of Indian art of the time. And then I'll just quickly briefly mention the three artists that they, they, they actually feature in the exhibition. Now, so Abhinath Tagore, uh, who started the nationalist movement, and the movement went on for a number of years, emerging, becoming very important. But 1920s, Bengal school began to be attacked from different quarters. One of the great challenges came from modernism, which of course arrived from the West, from Europe. And um, one of the things that happened at this time is the exhibition of the Bauhaus artists in Calcutta. It's a very ama amazing event. But Abhinath himself was not directly related to the next phase of Indian art, but Gaganath Tagore was a pioneer in using the language of Cubism to create a whole lot of amazing painting. So he actually was one of the people who began to move away from Bengal school Orientalism towards modernism. Uh, uh, so th that's how the whole next phase began. And then uh, one of the things uh, which is mentioned in the title is very intriguing. Rabindar Tagore, Rabindar Tagore actually was, uh, so he was a nationalist. He was quite involved with Abhinath's movement, but he himself was not so interested. So in his uh, 60s, he began to develop his own very modernist, very avant-garde, powerful works of art. And in fact, he has a lot of links with 
modernist artists in Europe, which was not obvious until now. In fact, uh, I was sent a little note from uh, Munich, uh, Museum of Modern Art. They've just now discovered that uh, Tagore's painting, they have one, uh, was discovered in the uh, straw house amongst degenerate art. This was the art which was uh, condemned by the Nazis. So that's very interesting. So he's absolutely really very much in the forefront of modernism. So you do, we do see these different phases of uh, development, of, I would say, modern art in India from colonial period, resistance by Abhinath Tagore leading on to modernism of Gogodanath and, of course, really culminating in Rabindranath Tagore. So you'll see these different galleries that deal with these different aspects. And um, I, I, I won't go to, you know, very long into this, but just to mention that digital works were lent by Victoria Memorial Hall as well as Victoria Albert Museum in London. So these are complemented by digital models and analytical drawings prepared by the University you know, sort of uh, Liverpool. And uh, interestingly enough, you have one set in Konnogur, that's where the whole thing started and Konnogur Garden House was restored, restored by uh, the Liverpool group. And now it's become quite popular, but of course it can't have big, as he not yet, big, big uh, collection of uh, art, Indian art. So you have this virtual exhibition in Konnogur, as well as the, here, tonight, Victoria Memorial Hall. And I hope you'll enjoy both, you know, particularly this one tonight. Okay. Thanks. Sir. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Mitchell. Thank you very much. Um, sure, and uh, what I'll do is, uh, can I invite then um, Jamila um, and uh, Alistair and Jimmy to present now. Uh, what we will try to show you is the, the really the technical side of it and how it was structured technically and how um, flexible that is. Uh, before I actually go into the content, which I will do myself here, but before that, uh, uh, the team in Liverpool will present the outline of the technical structure. So over to you. Oh, hi, 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 everybody. I think um, I'm going to start. Um, uh, my name's Alistair Eelbeck, and I'm from, from CAVA. And uh, along with Professor Richard Coet, we um, kind of developed the technological, original technolo technology um, strategy behind this project. So I, I just want to give a, a brief overview of what the, the overall strategy, a uh, reasonably high level uh, of this project was. And then hand over to um, Jamila, who will talk about the, the uh, sort of curatorial and uh, narrative and scholastic side, and Jimmy, who who will go in a little bit more deeper into the technical side. Uh, now, I realise there's about 35, four, there's 42 people online. Uh, I, if this isn't going to work, it doesn't matter. I can just speak. But I, I was wondering if you could share, uh, enable sharing, so I could just pop a video because the, there's a, the video that's displaying on one of the big screens. Uh, in front of you there um, in the Victoria Memorial Hall. Uh, I think it would be useful for everybody to see that on this call. So I'm just going to see Swimian. Is that possible? Yeah, or yeah, should I just, just give me on? one second. I think that's being done. Just. All right. Uh, I think this is working. I'm going to assume it is, and I, I'm going to start. So uh, really the idea behind this project, especially from a technical perspective, was um, – how we could use immersive technology and technology in general to to be able to attract different audiences and to be able to disseminate um, cultural venues and cultural organizations uh, artistic material in, in different ways and uh, really the the and I start with could the question we ask ourselves could we create a content management system that used exactly the same data but that supported you know a couple of user journeys 
So uh, particularly, could we create, uh, use uh, a single content management system that would, we could curate a remote exhibition, like um, the example that we're launching today of this virtual uh, gallery exhibition, and then uh, also have a augmented reality exhibition that would appear uh, actually within the garden house. Um, and uh, so we could actually, uh, so, so a, a small a small kind of gallery or cultural venue could, could uh, exhibit to everybody across the world, but also provide something um, uh, on site. Uh, and, and so that's exactly kind of what we, not, that was what we set out to do and pretty much that's what we've achieved so we had these two user journeys um the remote exhibition that, that everybody was that we're launching today uh, and then using augmented reality be able to place virtual artifacts or, or virtual pieces of art uh, that maybe that, that you know that may, that will pro that exist in external collections but be able to bring them together into one physical space um and then actually during the project, we, we explored another opportunity, which was to actually, could we take that same data and use it to create a fully immersive exhibition using a virtual reality headset? Um, so that this is something that we're prototype that you can kind of see here is that, um, that we all, all the data behind all these three user journeys is, is the same. It, we're using basically 99% of the same back end and 99% of the same front end. Uh, there's a few tweaks to, to uh, optimize the way they're presented into these different formats. Um, and, and the common theme, which is probably the second, you know, out of the two major innovations behind this project is that all, all of these, uh, all of these different perspectives are, are all web-based. So there is no need to download an app. Even uh, when, you're, when you're looking at the exhibition in a, in a virtual headset, an Oculus Quest, you're simply going to the native web application um, the, the, in that system and going to a website, and then you are you, you can effectively walk around the exhibition um, if you you know if your room is big enough. Um, so really, that's the, the two kind of overarching technological innovations I think behind this is that we have we developed a spatial CMS that allows us to uh, allows the curators and administrators to curate exhibitions that live remotely on the web. Uh, specifically on site using augmented reality and also um, uh, using fully immersive technologies. Uh, so that's that's the that was the project. That's what we kind of delivered, and today is a big big milestone in that. Uh, and I think I'd like to turn over to maybe Jamila to discuss some more of the the, the narrative uh, and the kind of curatorial and scholastic perspective to the, the types of content, and then finish with Jimmy. Uh, Maybe thanks. we will then just take us in more detail about this technology. Thanks. So thank you very much. Hello. Hi. Yeah. Can I share my screen? Yes, please. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay, thanks, Shaman, and good afternoon, everyone. So following on from Alistair's sort of technical presentation, I'm going to provide a brief overview of the narrative that we developed uh, um, behind the, the technical side of this digital uh, resource. So the presentation is structured around uh, uh, four key aspects of the virtual exhibition, the concepts, so the ideas and the aims behind um, uh, this joint venture, then the research questions and the methods we employed from a research point of view, the outcome, i.e. the actual virtual uh, exhibition as a, an immersive experience, and then the curatorial strategy that we decided uh, um, to adopt. So starting from the uh, concept, uh, um, this is a, a virtual exhibition which was initially produced uh, in English and then mostly translated into Bengali. And uh, it has a threefold uh, uh, aim, which is that of uh, paying homage to internationally renowned uh, uh, Indian painter Abhinindranath Tagore and his seminal key contribution to modern Indian art. 
that of presenting, so starting and presenting the uh, architectural type of the garden house, as Professor Mitter was mentioning, uh, locally referred to as a Bagambari, which uh, represents uh, uh, a very important architectural type of West Bengal, particularly during the 18th and 19th century. And uh, the physical translation, translation of important aspects of Bengali society and culture. And finally, to showcase the Konnagar Garden House and its, uh, and its associations and its links and the formative influence it had uh, on uh, um, uh, Tagore's uh, childhood, his formative years, but uh, most importantly, his later artistic uh, development. We asked ourselves three main uh, uh, interconnected uh, uh, research uh, questions, and we pursued them uh, uh, through a combination of uh, archival research, uh, field uh, architectural documentation, which was in turn a combination of uh, um, drone documentation as well as photographic documentation, both terrestrial and uh, aerial, through uh, a drone, as well as uh, two-dimensional and three-dimensional visualization. And the questions we asked ourselves were how did garden houses such as the Kornagar one evolve during the 19th century? How did they enable urban creative minds such as the Tagores to take in the life world and the essence of the culture of their time, so struggling the uh, 19th and the 20th century, and how did such understandings of the world and such worldview interact with the three main, three key concerns of 20th century Indian art, which are, as Professor Mitra uh, mentioned, modernity, nationhood, and the unconscious depths of our mind. Sorry. So the outcome of these uh, uh, work is, as my colleague Alistair has quickly shown from a more technical perspective, a combined uh, uh, location, site-based uh, augmented reality experience and an online web-based uh, interactive 3D experience with the aim to uh, showcase, to present the building's uh, history in its social cultural context, but also and, and possibly most importantly to disentangle the links, the uh, relationships between the house, the setting, particularly the riverine setting in which the house um, is located uh, with the artist's work. And this combined experience uh, uh, is meant to offer an understanding of the type of morphological qualities and the spatial as well qualities of the building, its changes, uh, its morphological transformations over time, as well as an understanding of the role that certain um, entertainment and leisure retreats, such as garden houses of West Bengal, offered in uh, um, expressing and putting forward uh, um, a form of colonial resistance. So from a curatorial point uh, of view, our aim was to develop a contextualized historical and, and cultural uh, experience through a combination of both uh, virtual and physical um, aspects of it. Uh, the totems, which you see in the top uh, uh, image, are uh, virtual, so they don't exist in reality. But we decided uh, to place them uh, um, in front of the eastern entrance, which is currently the main entrance into the Conagar uh, house, in order to provide uh, to the virtual user uh, context about uh, uh, the, around the exhibition. So you can see four posters uh, uh, hanging on these uh, uh, four um, uh, metal-looking totems, and they are in order uh, a layout of the exhibition, with what we call exhibition intro, then um, a reconstruction of the uh, key morphological changes uh, uh, undergone by the house over the time, and then uh, um, uh, a board, a poster about the history of the garden house, house in general uh, as a building type, and then uh, some analytical uh, outputs um, of the typology and typological attributes and qualities, again, of the Bagambari type. And then uh, what you see in the bottom uh, screenshot, the rooms, which are um, a selection of the rooms which exist in reality in the interior space of the house, four rooms which were uh, 
uh, earmarked uh, to showcase uh, selected artworks, uh, which we organized uh, according to four uh, main thematic strands, which are River Garden, Narrating the Nation, Realm of the Unconscious, and Modernity. I need to mention that although uh, the title of the exhibition mentions Abanindranath Tagore only. His work, he, the, the sample of artworks by uh, Abanindranath that we selected uh, is contextualized, so is presented, but also narrated and interpreted in the context of um, um, relevant artworks by he, his elder brother, uh, Gaganendrana Tagore, and uh, their uncle, uh, as well as Nobel laureate uh, Rabanindrana Tagore. So uh, this comes to the end of my brief overview. I would just like to acknowledge the main contributors to uh, the work, various members uh, uh, of the Archeum Center, members of CAVA, uh, particularly Professor Richard Keck, uh, who is one of the two directors of the center, and then FIDAR, which is the research and development uh, uh, VR and AR focused studio led by uh, Alistair Ailbeck and James Bailey. And finally, various members of the ugly chapter of the uh, Indian National Trust for Art and Cultural Heritage, we, who supported us in uh, uh, particularly in the archival research and the uh, content interpretation. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Jamia. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Jimmy, do you want to take over now? Can you hear me, Jimmy? Yeah. I, I'm, I'll take over now, if that's uh, okay. Thanks, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you very much. I, so, I'm hoping, sorry, my controls are in the way. No, it's fine. Okay, can, is my screen clear? It should be showing Garden House? Yeah, it does. Perfect. Thank you very much. So uh, I'm the lead developer for the Garden House projects, and I'm technical director for Feed AR. Uh, and I'm here to discuss uh, the approach uh, that was implemented in terms of developing the CMS system in particular. CMS system was um, unusual, differed from a traditional CMS in that it had to have uh, support for spatial data uh, to support the virtual gallery. Um, and the, the problem with that was that uh, we need to make it user friendly so that curators and administrators could uh, access it and modify the data without excluding them by making it overly complex, like something like AutoCAD or, or Cinema 4D, and support them in their work to accurately and effectively capture the historical content. So I've got a small demonstration here of uh, an admin administrator adding some artwork to the virtual gallery so they've come to one of the rooms they've selected the wall they've selected to add a picture and they drag across the wall to add the artwork and once they've selected it they're prompted to select a piece of artwork and then they can select that artwork and they are put then in the virtual galleries if they were stood there in person and check the alignment and in this instance, they're rehanging the picture to make sure that it's kind of correctly aligned. Um, so there are a lot of steps where um, the system kind of jumps ahead a little bit and tries to support the user. And it is, exports 3D assets and data, which is accessible for XR, AR, and VR applications, whether developed for web or using uh, an environment such as Unity. So um, very much the focus was on uh, user-friendly design. Sorry, I'm not too My pictures have disappeared. Sorry, I'm just going to try and go back into this again. Okay, and we'll come out of this because not all the uh, pictures, sorry, pictures showing up there, fine. Right, so, um, sorry, user-focused uh, design, it needed to be accessible. So even though it's a very technical project, the collaborators were uh, were our curators and administrators. So we tried to make the CMS as accessible as possible. Uh, so this put um, this fitted with our user-first philosophy, which means that the development team is encouraged to invest the extra time required to make features as speedy and as efficient to use as possible. This includes making quality of life improvements, such as auto-highlighting mistakes or missing content, which is uh, demonstrated here on the right-hand side. 
Our development framework is designed to suit continuous adaptation, including hot loaded code and uh, changes and continuous delivery pipeline, which allows us to respond quickly to change requests, uh, such as new features. This is not the first spatial CMS that we have developed. The first one that we developed was for Liverpool, uh, a city saw guide where um, administrators could associate stories with buildings around Liverpool. So the only real difference between the Reba system and the garden house was the, the level that spatial data was being managed at. With Reba, it was being managed at the city level, and with the garden house, it was managed on a room by room basis uh, around a single building. Um, a part, an important part of our strategy was to a continuously adapt, and uh, this is um, a, a very, rather a technical approach was to have reusable components and a dynamic database, which means the fact that we went, um, we could, we had flexibility in, in the way that we adapted the CMS to fit requirements at a later date. Um, and we, it was really important that we invited the curators and administrators into that process of how the CMS was developed. So we invited them into sort of like join our Kanban board so they could uh, not only just report bugs, but also um, kind of raise requests for kind of quality of life improvements, uh, be involved in the process in terms of prioritizing those features and then have visibility as those features were fixed and sort of like progressed through to completion and when they were ultimately released. Uh, altogether, I mean, sometimes sort of like some new features could be rolled out in like five minutes. So sort of like it was just such an efficient process. So most of the data was actually been modified and changed on the front end, which is, just, um, and that's really why a schemeless database was so sort of like important in this instance to allow us the flexibility to move really, really quickly and to roll out new functionality. One of those pieces of functionality was rolled out very, very quickly was multilingual support. It was done quite late in the process because uh, initial priority was in terms of getting the correct data hierarchy to support the functionality and the, the, the concept that the curators and the administrators had uh, put together. But even so, because of the technical, technical framework that was in place, uh, multilingual support was actually quite easy and quick to add. Like I say, so that was put focus on usability. So ensuring the fact that we provided the tools so that uh, curators could quickly compare translations, highlight where translations were missing and instances where there were no translations yet available, the application didn't fail because it fell back to a default language. Finally, so like, um, and the one of the important aspects of the CMS was the addition of uh, QR codes so that we could expose uh, the virtual content in the physical space so that people in the physical space had easy access to QR codes so they could um, uh, scan from the phone and get access to web pages and away at web AR ex experiences. And in the CMS, we implemented this in quite a smart way so that uh, the, QR, the CMS system was responsible for generating QR codes, but also those QR codes could be dynamically linked to content. So after they'd been printed out and put, on, put up onto walls in the, in the physical gallery space, curators and administrators could kind of choose to dynamically switch what that content pointed to at a later date, uh, which uh, eliminated the need to reprint QR codes but also meant the fact that QR codes could be multi-purpose. So, so like it could point to a basic web page or it could point to uh, a, a richer AR experience as demonstrated here in the bottom right corner. Anyway, uh, thanks very much for giving me time to present. I'll pass this back over to you. Thank you. Thanks, Jimmy. Um, okay, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll do my bit of the presentation now, if that's okay. So what we'll do is that we will reserve uh, the question and answer session till the end. I will try to go through as quickly as I can um, through these slides. I know we are sl running slightly late, uh, but I hope that you'll be able to uh, see the kind of complementary side of this, which is uh, the content and how we, um, we've uh, actually been researching the content Okay, um, and I'll I'll be as quick as I can. Um, I don't want to s sit down and talk. 
I'll, I'll be here. Uh, what uh, I've sort of titled this part of my talk is uh, The House by the River, Avon Indurant and the Kunnagar Garden House. Of course, there are many dimensions to this, and many of these things have been talked about. And uh, one is that the pilot project has developed a hybrid um, uh, digital exhibition experience. And the eventual am ambition is to scale it up so that we can have this virtual experience um, rolled out to a number of um, smaller museums, galleries across uh, the country, because I think the cost effectiveness of this is a, a, s a significant one. And it's, as I say, that it's a relatively low cost uh, possibility. Uh, I think that can, uh, combined with actual artifacts, could be a really, really important aspect of uh, the work. Um, and the digital constructions as um, op offer a different opportunity for research, which conventional research uh, outputs through books and papers uh, might not be able to do. So that I think there is, uh, it's not about either or, it's about and. And that's what I think we are uh, hoping to show through, through the work we are doing here. Um, we, uh, the Archaeum Research Center, uh, as has been mentioned, but we work across the world. We are in different parts of the world, especially in the Asia, Middle East, and North Africa, and we work quite extensively in areas of heritage uh, in these uh, parts of the world. Um, we have a team which has got a core membership on, as you can see on the left hand side, uh, right hand side, but also we draw in teams as and when necessary. For this particular um, project, we had uh, a quite a large team, but also has been mentioned that you know we had many partners. So sort of pulling together those partners from Liverpool University, the research centres in Liverpool University, Intac, and so on, we have a really interesting and diverse team. We had tra trainees, interns. We have also one of the researchers, Purva Chatterjee, is present here today, and also I think uh, Pritima is here too. Uh, there, uh, I think we've got a really, really excellent team um, over here. Um, the exhibition is, as I would like to mention, is a sort of what's important about this one. And because as uh, uh, Bartometer has said and Jamila has spoken about, that much of this has been um, uh, because uh, of the generosity of the Victoria Memorial Hall that we actually had access to the digital output. However, that is not only what we are doing. So the exhibition is not just about Abhinath's work or about the garden house in Kornagar either. So it brings more than the VMH collection. As you can see on the right hand side, this is a VNA uh, uh, art piece which uh, we, we've been able to acquire. Uh, and uh, so we are actually bringing together VMH work material, VNA material, and our own material, plus we are bringing together an angle that uh, is uh, very dif distinct, and that's what makes it a different thing from what has already happened or is already visible. Now, the most important thing that I would like to say in here is that you know, this entanglement of things and their context, that is what is important for us. You know, things have, um, uh, they're connected to spaces, they're connected to cities, they're con connected to all sorts of people and things. So, a connected, entangled nature of things. And those things, those physical contexts could be physical, but also it could be uh, abstract, like social, cultural, political, and economic context. But these objects also have a prehistory, I might say. Um, prehistory or a pre-life, that is the before the creation of the artifact, but also an afterlife, certainly beyond its creation. So we are trying to look into the artifact as something that is uh, really um, uh, in space and in time, connected with a range of other uh, objects, persona, and artifacts. So. Three interconnected questions uh, here, and Jamila has touched upon those. How did the garden houses like Konagos evolve during the 19th century? Because um, A, that uh, obviously Swati Chattopadha has spoken a lot about the bigger country houses, Warren Hastings and so on. Now, that aside, there was a huge number of 
smaller garden houses, which played a very important role in the social cultural reconstruction and the restructuring in the 19th century. And that's something that we would be, we were very keen to understand. And how did the country retreats offer, how did they offer urban creative minds such as Auburn in the North opportunities to imbibe the life world and their sense of the culture? Because clearly they use this as a scopic device. They use this as a kind of a viewing platform through which they actually see the, the world around them um, coming out of their uh, urban settings. And how did such understandings coexist and interact with three important 20th century concerns? Uh, obviously, modernity, nationhood, and unconscious, that's been mentioned. Three artists we uh, pick up, Abhinandranath, his elder brother, uh, Gaurinandranath, and Rabindranath, of course. Um, I'm not going to go through everything because that is not um, uh, probably because you'll have the opportunity to go through the material yourself. But what I'll try to do is to highlight a few things that we have discovered that are distinct uh, from other uh, interpretations and material that we find. Now, uh, the beginnings of this connection is obviously Abhinandran spent a summer in around 1877, 88 in that garden house. And the house was never previously uh, one of the things that happens is there's been a lot of debate about whether this was the house, the garden house, that was connected to his childhood. And that's something that we think that we have shown now the fairly conclusively that it was indeed uh, connected to the, the extended Tagore family. And also his memoir shows that it influenced his understanding of the Indian condition and aspects of his future creativity, which we'll t try to touch upon. And we also highlight the, the how they tackle these different things about nationhood, modernity, and the complexity of uh, the, the uh, consciousness. Now, it, to an extent, it starts off from uh, you know, what they currently have, which is that following the, the restoration, which is not kind of in a, in a classic sense of restoration, but nevertheless, it is really worth uh, pointing out that it's a really impressive piece of work. But they actually put the uh, the Bharat Mata, uh, Mata reproduction uh, in in the middle of that central hall, and that kind of defines the then the orientation reorganization of the the various uh, uh, galleries that we proposed. The central one is about the the nation nationhood. The southern side is actually about modernity. The northern side is about, the northern veranda is about the unconscious, and the one that is in the front entrance porch area, which uh, locates the uh, Abhinandranath's work, or some of the work, in the context of the house, uh, in the context of the garden house. So, the organization is around the, the central one, which has got the um, the Bharat Mata, and therefore we thought that it would be good. Uh, it's also, uh, I think, um, in a way more effective to sort of use the, the room as it you know, was proposed and therefore uh, organize uh, the other galleries around it. So we had on the southern side of the, uh, on the, southern side of the um, uh, central hall, we had the um, the modernity on the northern side, the unconscious, and the the one on the front on the eastern side at the entrance was the one that uh, the gallery that looked into Avinash's connection with the, uh, the, the 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 particular location. So basically, four totems which uh, uh, Jamila had mentioned. It kind of covers the garden house and its typology and history, and the four rooms which are. Uh, about the, the artwork, the river garden, which is where uh, the connection is made, modernity narrating the nation and realms of the unconscious. Um, the, I'm not going through all the artist's work, it's only uh, a few selections. And so here, for example, that we have uh, in the river garden, the, 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 he in his uh, memoir, Jurasha Kodhare, talks about the, the garden, the, uh, the jackfruit tree. And so some of the things that you know, we pick up which are really uh, also 
uh, influencing his early paintings, especially of uh, landscapes, Bengali landscapes. Things like when he describes the jackfruit tree that the hung that hung low like a giant parasol, which was outside my Louvre window, and from there he all obviously experiences this fantastical dance of um, you know, fireflies. Uh, in my excitement, I had completely overlooked though that the fact that the bright lights were nothing else but fireflies swirling under the leafy jackfruit tree. Um, so. The other part, of, again, talking about the same thing about the Ganges as he was in Connaught in 1877-78. When clouds gathered over the Ganges, it was a wonderful sight to behold. Within minutes, half the river was covered in darkness, while the others stayed bright and sunny. Uh, those observations were very important in his later paintings as well. These, uh, the Ganges flowed, but also the boats glided on this uh, the the kind of sheety surface of the of the river uh, fishing boats scampered home to their safety of the banks at the first sign of a brewing storm the verse river never lonely and mysterious um, here he also mentions that this is the first place where he learned he understood and closely observed the how the bengali hut looked the kurekhar i didn't even notice before that the thatched roof descended in a curve and that's when I first saw a real Bengali hut, hut when in Konnagar, and uh, he hadn't forgotten since, that's what he was saying. So we are uh, not talking about a lot of those things in great detail, which you can, of course, observe, look at, read the descriptions. Uh, we also look a little more in a, uh, about the kind of, the, the, in the Arabian Night series, where uh, we find that you know the collapsing time, the collapsing geographies, and the collapsing distinction between myths and reality are something that uh, are uh, very interesting to us, and we talk about <coughs> that a little bit. Another piece that I'll talk about is the 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 way that, in terms of moder modern modernity and modernism, uh, Gaganandas uh, interrupted Cubist fragments, which is something that I would say is some uh, a piece that we connect with later modern developments in, in, in uh, Indian architecture as well. So Gaganandana's interrupted Cubist approach was uh, resulted in either Cubist fragments floating in allegorical space or expressive narrative moments captured within Cubist frames. So either the Cubism frames the narrative or the narrative frames the Cubist work. Um, that actually has very close, interesting connections with uh, the work of the Cubit. Cub so, in this case, it's about Cubist geometry and poetic narrative. In the case of the purists who work in the 1920s, especially through uh, uh, Après le Cubism, uh, where uh, Ozafin and Charles Edouard Genere, were who was Le, le Cubisier, uh, they, uh, from 1918, began the Sprit Nouveau, the new spirit, and that spoke about the death of Cubism and what lies beyond Cubism. So that there, what they do is that... Uh, could, I, could I request that people um, mute their um, um, <laughs> devices, please? Sorry. Uh, Gaganandrath and Jenneray paintings did not cover the entirety of the pictorial. Can I ask you to mute your devices, please? Uh, Gaganandat and Genre's paintings did not cover the entirety of the pictorial volume. Gaganandat's positive cubist <laughs> objects found themselves engulfed in equally positive and prominent poetic narratives but the more instrumental representation of Le Corbusier's orthographic fragment objects was suspended within platonic volume. So instead of the narrative versus the cubist the work, here it's about the fragment objects and the suspended platonic volumes. And that's something that we are, are um, you know, here looking at in the case of uh, Le Corbusier's, that is Genre's work in Ahmedabad in the Mill Owners Association building. Uh, where we have these suspended volumes within space, both horizontally, but in the case of the uh, Le Corbusier's Chandigarh Assembly Building, we have those volumes suspended in space. Um, the, then let's move on to the garden house, and uh, that's 
the other part of it, uh, where we uh, we know where Konagor is, and you know where uh, this is. What we know what? from Avanindranath uh, Jurakar Shakodhari is that he talks about our Kornagar garden. And that, is, uh, that means that it was either owned or by the Tegos or on a long-term rent uh, for their use during visits uh, f by the family. But was, the gar was this the garden house that he is talking about? Now, one of the important things that we discovered during our work is that in the famous painter Jamini Prakash Ganguly, who died in 18, 1953, sold the house, the garden house, in October 1939, uh, then no, known also as Kannagar Villa, to pull in Krishna Rai, who was from the Bhagakul Rai family. So, um, due to which seems to be due to financial strains, and we have evidence of that. The property then uh, was in the uh, had been in the possession of the Gangulis because this uh, legal document is really interesting social history because it talks about uh, the sort of previous 50, 60 years of possession and an, old, uh, an occupation. So it looks like that it will have been under the control of the Tagore family uh, because the Gangulis were actually um, uh, uh, Jamini Prakash Gangulis. Uh, grand, uh, grandfather, Jogesh Prakash Ganguly, was actually married to Abhinindranath's paternal aunt, Kadambini Devi, who uh, died in 1888. Now, following the tradition of the family, the, he was a kind of live-in son-in-law uh, at Jurashako, and therefore that's how the connection was made. So, this also, one of the things that you know, it showed us is that this land Although the house was owned by the Gangulis and therefore the extended uh, Tagore family, but the land was not owned by them. The land was owned partly by Jayakrishna Mukherjee of the Uttarpara uh, family, Jamindar family, but also by David Waldi Company at that point. Now, obviously, that meant that you know the, uh, the Jayakrishna Mukherjee's family, the Uttarpara, what they call the Uttarpara or Jamindar Bari, uh, we, they were. Uh, they benefited from the Permanent Settlement Act, but also they benefited from the siege of Bharatpur, where they uh, received quite a lot of resources. So uh, we started to understand how they expanded their uh, land holdings post 1793, or sort of from the early 1800s over the, over the next 40, 50 years. And close ties with the East India Company also made that happen. Uh, so. What we think is that the garden house could have been built by the company, army engineers, in the late uh, 1820s or very early 30s to facilitate troop movement. And that's uh, something uh, we wanted to also understand that uh, was David Waldy connected? Uh, David Waldy is often, we don't know, is that he was associated with the first use of chloroform in anesthesia. And uh, he, was, he also made his way through Liverpool, which is an interesting connection, and his archives are based in, located in Liverpool. And that, uh, but he also, we realized that, you know, although there is a David Waldy company in Kurnagar now, but that only came into uh, action there in Kurnagar in the early 20th century, not before that. So before that, he was, had a, a factory in Kashipur in Calcutta, in North Calcutta, and he commuted from Howrah in Ghushuri, and probably he was one of the earliest commuters in that sense, he, from where he had actually built another garden house, and from Ghushuri he would take the Palki, and then the Palki would go all uh, in, uh, on a boat, and then the boat will cross the river, and on the other side the Palki will take him to the office. So that he did, and he thought that he took that journey in around an, uh, an hour or so every day, uh, up and down. And that's where I think that we begin to see a kind of be a better picture of how the house uh, and the property, so the, the property, the land was owned by the Uttarpara Zamindar family originally, and the property was first rented out to the Tagores, the extended Tagores, and then it came into the possession of the, the faction of the Tagore family, which is the Gangulis, who then sold it to the Bhagukul Roys at a later time. So uh, that history is a real important discovery for us, and it actually tells us very interesting things about social history in, in uh, 19th century Bengal, especially in, a, in the riverine landscape. Uh, I will end with one thing that is about how the type, house type developed. 
So there is a kind of classical um, sort of uh, symmetrical design, as Professor Mitter was mentioning, and then that was uh, slightly uh, changed uh, in order to actually allow access to the river, and therefore the, it results in two smaller rooms and a central space uh, and an entrance foyer on the river side. And then that house was also, so the, the, the verandas on the north and the south side were then blocked off to make more of rooms rather than um, the kind of open verandas that we normally had in order to make it more habitable. So you see that stage of the, the change. And then finally, in the, probably in around 1940s, the, late, the back end, the western end, was added, which wasn't there. And you can see that in the two different levels of the roof as well. So I will finish here, and I would like to invite you to now have a look at the, uh, the Garden House uh, exhibition uh, site, which you can uh, go through in your, uh, at your leisure. But if there are any questions to us, that is to my team in Liverpool, and as well as me here, then I'm very happy, we are very happy to answer any questions. Thank you. questions let me know but thank you for your patience because that's been a bit of a interestingly interrupted uh, event Hi, uh, good evening everyone. Uh, hi, Soumya. My question is, which are the next set of, uh, you know, the buildings and structures you are going to take up in next trip, and uh, how you are expanding this? Um, that, is, that is a difficult question to answer because simply um, we don't know. It all depends on uh, where the resources are going to come because it is, although it's low, relatively low cost, uh, but it's still going to be, um, you know, it will demand some resources and we need to um, also identify the right um, historic site perhaps, which will have the, the content to work with as well. So I think it has to come from two ends, you know, to make it happen. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. What kind of uh, resources did uh, you kind of, what was, what was the funding uh, amount like for the entire project? I think, yes, uh, we have tried to look into that and um, uh, to understand what would be a cost. Of. Yeah, um, so, in terms of financial support, we received overseas development support for this uh, from the British government, which came through the university, and that really uh, created the, the, the basic work for us, um, um, so uh, also including bringing in, uh, pulling together the staffing, uh, arranging all the other events and travels and so on and so forth. Uh, however, there is a lot of investment from our research center end, which is almost unaccounted for. But roughly, I think I would say uh, work like this would probably be about, you know, give or take about between 15 to 20 lakhs. So as opposed to a conventional exhibition, uh, 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 how how do we kind of uh, measure the you know cost effectiveness? I think if you think about just one, you know, if you think about good reproductions and the whole curatorial um, aspect of it, which will be um, quite a drawn out process. But I'm I'm not saying that this means that we do not. Uh, it this will complement 
physical installations rather than replace physical installations, right? But if you think about most of our, you know, cultural heritage sites, there is very little resources that are available to make things happen. And if you have to purchase uh, even very good reproductions, they are incredibly expensive. So I think that what my, our point is that, and this is also something that is incredibly flexible. The uh, physical um, uh, exhibition will be quite difficult to change or it will, uh, it will require new resources. Whereas here, the digital um, sets when available can be easily uh, deployed and reorganized and the exhibition can be reorganized. So for example, what Jimmy was talking about, the, you know, the content management system is a very simple management system which can be um, fed with uh, other metadata very quickly, uh, fairly quickly. Of course, what is important is that it's done through a um, uh, highly knowledgeable curatorial team that will uh, include experts and so on. But it is much easier to manipulate an exhibition. So if, for example, that if we want to do it on seasons, you know, in there, we should be able to do that in probably about, a, you know, a couple of months time. Whereas, you know, you wouldn't be able to do the same thing in, a, in the case of a physical exhibition. Uh, sure, I had a question. Uh, but firstly, a huge congratulations to you and the whole University of Liverpool team and Kava and all your partners, including the Victoria Memorial Hall. Um, before I come to my question, I had some reflections on that, which is regarding the environmental implications of moving physical ex exhibitions in across the world with this kind of material and the carbon footprint and everything that we would leave. And your exhibition is virtually already doing that. So uh, what I wanted to know from you and everybody else, anyone who's willing to answer, because Professor Parthomitir spoke earlier and I very fondly remember his discussions with us about the virtual cosmopolis. Do you think that you have uh, embarked upon a virtual cosmopolis of knowledge exchange and you know which which happened in the 20th century it's almost it seems like the a new cycle is starting with the virtual exhibition and the augmented reality where you are allowing people all across the world to access what is happening in a very situated locale and you know and what do you see the implications of that uh, might be in the future because when, when in the 20th century and the 19th century, when the print cultures were moving, that had an enormous repercussion historically on the way uh, art cultures hybridized. And Aubanindranath and the uh, Kolkata Bauhaus exhibition are a product of that. And how, how, how do we see that happening through heritage practices in the present day? I think uh, that's a very thought-provoking question in the sense that um, probably we do not know what the implications would will be you know in the in the future but certainly I think um, when when we th I do not think that the the locale will go uh, will be dispensed with and it should never be and I think it's very important that you know we understand how we represent and this is uh, I'm trying to think that in, in this exhibition, there are certain things which are, you could argue, some, to an extent, floating, in the sense that um, the Gogonandrath or, or, or Robindranath does not, is not directly connected to this. But we brought them in through a network of themes, which are connected and relevant, but on the one, on the other hand, that what roots it to this place is Avandana's relationship to the the river. So even the virtuality has to actually pick up that rooted locale and to uh, really f then uh, organize and orchestrate the material around that. So I feel that it's very important that it's not about any, so I'm, I'm thinking that it's not about having any exhibition, and this has got important implications in terms of 
heritage sites and what we do with heritage sites. And I don't think that, firstly, I don't think that the heritage sites should not, should never be just museums. It is absolutely wrong to do that. Uh, on the other hand, I think it's also this rootedness can or should be always uh, kept in the, in the, uh, in a central uh, part of the thinking. Now, when then it travels, and if we can make sure that that travels with that rootedness, then I think there is a new connection made. And also because of the, the flexibility and the kind of uh, the agility with which digital material could be connected up, I feel that there are really interesting opportunities there of the global proliferation of the cosmopolis that you're talking about in the way that we might be able to make new meanings. Because another thing that has often happened is that with rootedness is that also fixity with meaning. And we know now that that is also um, a difficulty, a problem that we have been dealing with. And perhaps this is an opportunity to, with rigor, to begin to understand how these connections and movements between ideas will occur. Yes, of course. Hello. May I ask my question? Sure. Mengali. A heritage site, Jitani Amrai Alochana Kurchi, Amadir Alochanate Asti Patuna. Just it a promoting way at Chilo, even most to site take a dom nostrogore fala huchilo. She jagateke, Konogore common people with the help of chairman of Konogor municipality, it take art kedieche, even chairman it catch act a birat, polovon, even life threat, Taka Shotteo. To a secretita bodae pamna chilo, Amar Mona Cherki, Mane eta judi to Shikar Korahai, Sip Jagai, to Hala. Nishay, absolutely. I mean, I project a Shuru Kori, Sheshwate, Amrakta, Aro Boro project in Motakaj Kotsilam, Shedahoche, Hugli River of Cultures. A projector, Te Amra Kolkata Ruture, Dorunoi Barakput, take a bandel, Eon Sultate, Amra Dexilam, Jotogolo. Jeglo ke bola hoto mini Europe, little Europe. Shei shahor gulo niye kaj kora hotsilo. Ian Magadera, amader Liverpool University, who was a PI, and I worked as a co-I with him. Ebar tokhon shei kaj cha korte korte, amra almost accidentally bapadito chatubadha shonge alap hoy. Ebang uni tokhon ukhane chairman chilen Konagor Municipality. Ebang bapadito abu tokhono barita kintu kono bhabei restore kora hoy ni. Ebang shayit shumayte ami ona shonge gye dhaka korte pere silam through connections. Ebang tarphole amra jeta tapar ona shonge katha bolate uni onik uni khub utshuk chilen je ki bhabei ki kora jay. Ebang abushay একটা টাকা পয়সার একটা ব্যাপার থাকে সবকিছুই থাকে তো তার মধ্যে যতটা সম্ভব আই থিংক উনি কিন্তু একটা অসাধারণ কাজ করেছিলেন তখন এই কাজটা যদি তখন না হতো তাহলে কিন্তু এই বাড়িটা চলে যেত এই কাজটা আবার যদি যদি জমির বিক্রিটা না আটকাতো তাহলে বাড়িটা চলে যেত এবং এই জিনিসটা কিন্তু একটা বড় শিক্ষা আমাদের পক্ষে এই লেসনটা যেটা আমরা পাচ্ছি এখন সেটা কিন্তু আমাদের অনেক জায়গা ছড়িয়ে দেওয়া যায় এবং ছোট ছোট ভাবে কিন্তু এটা কি কিন্তু আমি আমার মনে হয় যে আমি বিভিন্ন জায়গা যে কাজগুলো করি আমার মনে হয় সব সময় যে হেরিটেজ সাইটের কিন্তু একটা ইকোনমিক ভ্যালু আছে এবং সেই ভ্যালুটাকে কিন্তু সব সময় রাখতে হবে এই মুহূর্তে এখনো পর্যন্ত সেটা হয়নি কিন্তু সবচেয়ে বড় কথা যেটা হচ্ছে যে গ্রাস রুটস লেভেলে যে ধরুন ছোট ছোট বাচ্চারা বা বড়রাও আসছে বিশেষত রোববার দিন শনিবার দিন এটা কিন্তু একটা বড় পাওনা এবং সেই জিনিসটার উপর ভিত্তি করে আমাদের কিন্তু এই জিনিসটাকে বাড়িয়ে নিয়ে যেতে হবে তো অ্যাবসলিউটলি আমি এগ্রি করব যে বাপদিত্ত বাবুর অবদান এই ক্ষেত্রে অসামান্য সেই দিক থেকে এবং আমি আশা করব এটাও যে আগামী যা যে কাউন্সিলই আসুক যে গ্রুপই আসুক তারা যেন 
এই জিনিসটার প্রয়াসটাকে চালিয়ে যান ওকে Congratulations, Professor Vandabade, for your entire, you and your entire team from the University of uh, Liverpool for giving us a wonderful presentation. It was thoroughly enjoyable. And it was great because, you know, Indians in particular, the Indian educated classes and Bengalis, Bengali educated classes are, have totally forgotten, almost forgotten their heritage, you know. So it's a real, um, it's very, it's very uh, let's say, enabling for all of us to go back and understand our heritage better, more and more. Now, one thing I'm in my questions, but I want to be intrigued by your, you know, title, modern, uh, I mean, not modernity, nationhood, and unconscious. I understand modernity, nationhood, but unconscious, uh, I'm a bit intrigued. By what do you mean by unconscious? Unconscious, do you mean delving into the collective unconscious as what modern psychology suggests? That's my first question. And my second question to you is, this is wonderful, but other than Abhinanath, the other Bengal, the other from what constitutes the Bengal school of painting, like, you know, Gagendranath, Robindranath, uh, Ram Kinkar Bay, the others, other, uh, do you plan or do you have things on your pipeline of, you know, uh, working on the other great greats of the Bengal school of uh, painters? And third thing, you know, the, regarding, as you mentioned, developing on the heritage, Victoria was associated earlier also with a project where the riverfront in Chandanagar was developed. So that was wonderful, one thing which Victoria Memorial was associated. And uh, do you plan anything else, some developing some other <laughs> things, like what, like developing the riverfront in Chandanagar? Do you have any other plans of thinking along those lines where other things, uh, these things can be developed as heritage sites? Because Bengal has a grand, you know, history of heritage sites. And the, the tragedy is, you know, we are so poor at retaining them and, you know, and, you know, being aware of them. So I think the need of the hour is to make all people be aware and conscious of these sites. So do you plan, do you have anything in your pipeline to make us, to make the, uh, to, to work in this direction? Yeah. <laughs> okay. I, I think uh, I'm trying to remember those. I'll start from the back. Okay. So I'm from Chandanagar uh, originally. So therefore I have a, a very soft corner for Chandanagar. But I also think that uh, um, I think we are also incredibly reluctant to do anything when it comes to heritage because, as I was saying before, that um, we do not see the economic value. We have never made people aware that all the houses, the old houses, have economic value and they can yield good income for people. I'm thinking very practically about you know what can be done to many of these things. Now. I think that uh, it's very important also that that combined with the collective resistance, as was being discussed in the previous point, is crucial to keep any of these things going. Otherwise, very soon, everything will be gone. Now, I think that uh, uh, whether we should be working with about uh, the other artists of the Bengal school and beyond, and certainly, uh, I think, um, uh, there are important dimensions of modernity that I, interest me a lot because I think uh, modernity is a very vital um, way of making, bringing, bringing change. And I think uh, even within a postmodern context, I still think that modernity is, you know, uh, has taught us very important lessons, both in terms of you know, refuting it but also accepting it. But uh, so, yes, I would love to work on Ram Kinkar, for example, uh, but it all comes down to also resources. Right, because we as a research center, we are a non-profit research center, of course, for as the universities are. And, but the problem is that, you know, we still need resources to keep our people going. You know, I have to, you know, get the team together. We have got to get the team together to work on different aspects. Because you can see that these are, these need to bring in different kinds of expertise. And that is only possible when you can bring people in. People are passionate to work, but we need those resources to make it happen. I think that it's also very important that institutions like Victoria Memorial can also have a strategy of how they can help, not in a piecemeal way or a knee-jerk reaction, but something that there is, you know, there's a kind of structure to it. Then coming to the collective unconscious or the individual unconscious, the, the delving to that, I think the focus here, at, uh, we allude to the collective unconscious, but we mainly delve into the 
the individual unconscious in the work of Rabindranath Tagore. Because as you well know that Rabindranath's um, poetry, beautiful as it was, was very guarded, very conscious, you know, very careful. And it did not move from there. You know, even to, and you know, in the way he spoke, he never uttered, there was no pause when he spoke. You know, uh, and those are the kind of very, very structured minds. You know. But on the other hand, he had the other side of, you know, as most of us have, and that is that the unconscious. And so if you think about his work, the agonies that come out of those contorted forms, you know, the, those uh, kind of beasts that are human, partly human, uh, partly beasts, those are kind of interesting forms that are showing this very deep darkness sometimes, but also certain glimmers of hope there. But that is really what we delve into. If you think about the other parts of the unconscious, the collective one, I think we touch upon with some of the later work with uh, Avanindranath's later work, especially with the, um, you know, the, the um, uh, Arabian uh, Night series, because they are really, really fascinating. Because they collapse time, as I was saying, they collapse uh, all kinds of geographies and so on, and they ask questions about not only modernity but also about how we, our urban consciousness has developed, and that's something that uh, I've touched upon. We have touched upon in the in the content, but we haven't done a great deal. Okay. Uh, Professor Bandhupadhyay, I think uh, with that uh, we can close the Q&A session. Uh, the discussion can of course go on uh, through our collective consciousness uh, over tea later on. But uh, there is one little pleasant task to be performed before we disperse. Uh, I would like to at this stage acknowledge the presence of one of our members of the Board of Trustees, Mrs. Anita Chakraborty over here, and I would request her to kindly felicitate Professor Bandhapadhyay and through him his entire team who are also online. So maybe request you to hand over a bouquet of flowers to Professor Bandhapadhyay, please. And of course all of you deserve a very big hand. Thank you very much everybody and uh, there is a cup of tea waiting on this side. Uh, Tea on this side and fresh air on the other side. So whichever is your priority first. <laughs> Thank you very much and good night.